you, our presenters and guests, for this Cleveland Book Week event. I believe this event is not simply an academic exercise, but also a spiritual one, an opportunity for knowledge and understanding, challenge, maybe conversion, forgiveness, and healing. I pray for our presenters and uh, for all of us that we may be open to all of the grace and goodness that God can bring out of our time together this evening. In an honest and poignant document on racism and racial violence, the Roman Catholic bishops of the United States offer the following. They said, racism has been part of the social fabric of America since its European colonization, whether it be the tragic past of the Native Americans, the Mexicans, the Puerto Ricans, or the blacks. The story is one of slavery, peonage, economic exploitation, brutal repression, and cultural neglect. All have suffered indignity. Most have been uprooted, defrauded, or dispossessed of their lands, and none have escaped one or another form of collective degradation by a powerful majority. Our history is littered with the debris of broken promises and treaties, as well as lynchings and massacres that almost destroyed the Indians, humiliated the Hispanics, and crushed the blacks. But despite this tragic history, the racial minorities of our country have survived and increased. Each racial group has sunk its roots deep in the soil of our culture, thus helping to give to the United States its unique character and its diverse coloration. The contribution of each racial minority is distinctive and rich. Each is a source of internal strength for our nation. The history of all gives a witness to a truth absorbed by now into the collective consciousness of Americans. Their struggle has been a pledge of liberty and a challenge to future greatness. Today on the Roman Catholic liturgical calendar is the Feast of the Exaltation of the Holy Cross. I believe it's Providence that we're here together this evening. It's a day when Catholics reflect on the cross. St. John Paul II called the symbol of Christianity, how from that instrument of violence and state-sponsored punishment, God can bring about some goodness, our ultimate goodness, really, our eternal salvation. A tree was the cause of our fall in the Garden of Eden. But when God's Son was unjustly condemned by an angry mob on trumped-up charges and nailed to a tree, a tree became the source of life for all peoples of all places and all times. God is so good that out of grave injustice in the past, God can bring about some goodness in our present. That's certainly my prayer again this evening. Um, I hope that this event is the beginning of healing that God wishes to work in our neighborhood, especially as uh, the tragic lynching in 1911, took place very near a parish property on Lorraine Avenue. You can see it on the maps. And uh, there's been some discussion, and certainly all would be invited uh, in the future uh, to uh, a prayer service of a memorial and healing. So if you're interested in something like that, make sure that you sign up at the, uh, the check-in desk in the front. By honestly facing the sad events of history, nationally and locally, May God help us to learn something today, to make us truly wise, so that history's mistakes, its terrible and tragic mistakes, may not be repeated, but may benefit us for eternity, for the glory of God and salvation of souls. So again, welcome to everyone, and uh, may God bless our evening. Father Estabrook, for your hospitality and leadership tonight. Good evening. My name is Karen Long. I work on the Annisville Wolf Book Awards. I am so proud to be here with you, and my heart is full to see you tonight. I want to acknowledge that we stand on the lands of the Haudenosaunee Confederacy whose descendants continue to live in Northeast Ohio 
along with thousands of people from more than 100 tribes. We're here to talk about place, this place, and it feels right to be together and start with that remembrance. It's my honor to introduce two people whose voices will fill the room next. Um, very briefly, Samia Bray is the co-founder of the Black Environmental Leaders of Cleveland. She's a lifelong Clevelander, and very importantly, is the granddaughter of the Great Migration. Also a lifelong Clevelander is Terry Menner, a Cleveland Public Library librarian who will share his research with us tonight that helps explain why we are all here in this place. Terry. Thank you, Karen, the Cleveland Foundation, and Father Estercard for having me here today. I'm really honored to be sharing the stage with uh, Percival and Samia. Uh, it's a bit of a homecoming for me because I went to grade school here. Um, I'm not the best public speaker, but I was an even worse athlete, so I'm heartened by the fact that any stumbles in my talk likely won't be even close to the most embarrassing thing I've done in this gym. <laughs> Before I begin, I must acknowledge the work of Dr. Marilyn K. Howard, a recently retired professor at Columbus State Community College. Uh, her doctoral thesis, Black Lynching in the Promised Land, Mob Violence in Ohio, 1877 to 1916, led me to John Jordan's name, which then led to further discussions locally about how to properly memorialize him. Uh, I should also point out that almost all of what we know about this event was found in newspapers that were owned, operated by, and written primarily for white people. So we can fairly assume some inherent level of prejudice or even falsehood in the reporting of the events. Um, first, some historical background of Cleveland and the neighborhood. Uh, in 1911, Cleveland's African American population was highly concentrated in the Cedar Central neighborhood. Cleveland branch of the NAACP was less than a year old, and there were likely fewer than a dozen black families in the census tract we're now in. This neighborhood was in transition from a semi-rural farming area to a commercial and residential district. There were still fruit orchards and farms within walking distance of where we are now, and fields with tall grass dotted streets where middle-class homes were gradually rising. Around 9.30 a.m. on June 27, 1911, a Tuesday, John C. Decker, 28 years old, and Arthur B. Mesh, 20 years old, spotted a trio of men picking cherries in Decker's orchard from across what is now Clinton Road, near the Big Four railroad tracks. Decker ordered them off the property, and one of them replied with a demand, you talk to me like a gentleman. These are the only words we have that can be attributed to John Jordan. Some accounts say Jordan pulled his gun to burst, but Beamish himself stated that Jordan didn't pull a gun until Decker knocked him down, knocked down one of the other men, and then began chasing the three of them east down Clinton Road with a shotgun. Beamish and other cherry pickers joined the chase. Beamish took Decker's shotgun while Decker borrowed more weapons from neighbors. At one point, Beamish cornered Jordan in a coal yard near Ridge and Denison Road. Beamish's mother cried, let him go, Art. But this plea was ignored and the mob continued its chase, doubling back down the big four tracks through fields and exchanging shots with Jordan all the while. Jordan cut up north on West 97 toward the streetcar barn at 98th and Lorraine, where streetcar employees joined the chase. Newspapers of the day give wildly varying accounts of the size of the mob, placing it from 50 to 200 to as many as 500 in number. One of the streetcar men, Edward Singler, chased Jordan to a field across from the barn where Jordan tried to hide in tall grass, at this point having run at least two miles for his life over train tracks and through fields. The two exchanged shots. Jordan was hit three times and fell. Shouts of lynch him and hang him up came from the mob, and only strenuous measures by patrolmen Tennant and Sprosty prevented them from killing Jordan on the spot. The police initially attempted to take Jordan to their station for booking, somehow not realizing that he had been shot. When they finally noticed his wounds, they took him to St. John's Hospital, where he died almost immediately. On that very same day, 
In time for the afternoon papers, Lieutenant Gilbride of Cleveland Police, 10th Precinct, concluded his investigation and announced no arrest would be made. He was quick, quick to clear Decker, Beamish, Singler, and the mob of all blame. In Gilbride's words, quote, it had to be done. To quote Mama Z, no one was arrested, no one was charged, no one cared. Jordan was identified by a photograph of himself bearing his name found in his pocket. The barrenness of his death certificate reveals how little we know about him. File number 35355, age 35, occupation laborer, cause of death, homicide by gunshot. No family are listed, no obituary was written, and he was buried in Parkside Cemetery, a potter's field that was later exposed as a real estate swindle to block the development of a street railway through the owner's country estate in Bedford. I regret that I have not had much more success in attempting to find more information about John Jordan or his family, but I am grateful for everyone gathering here today and the efforts of the Black Environmental Leaders Group to have an opportunity to remember him here today and in the future. Thank you. I'm Samia Bray, uh, co-director of the Black Environmental Leaders Association, also known as Bell. And I serve along with David Wilson and in the legacy of Jacqueline E. Gillen. Across the country, communities are engaging in restorative truth-telling and working towards repairing the harms caused as a result of an era of enslavement, an era of racial terror, lynching and violence, an era then followed by Jim Crow segregation, and an ongoing era of mass incarceration in our nation. It is believed these efforts are critical to advance a new era of truth and justice. Brian Stevenson, executive director of the Equal Justice Initiative said, somebody has to stand when other people are sitting. Somebody has to speak when other people are quiet. At Bell, we agree with the notion and understand that the way we acknowledge historical injustice, recognize injustice in our own lives and communities today, and work toward the goals of equitable justice and truth telling are shaped by three things. One, how we publicly remember the past. Two, how we tell the stories of who we are, and three, how we explain the way our past influences our present. Tonight, as we explore these issues and discuss the implications of bringing a community remembrance project to Cleveland to remember John Jordan, our conversation will be guided by the values of authenticity, forthrightness, collaboration, listening, with respect, and empowering courtesy. In partnership with our host, the St. Ignatius of Antioch Catholic Parish, which, as Father Esterbrook stated, is located near the 1911 event, Bell, the Cleveland Public Library, the Cleveland Foundation, the Annisville Wolf Book Awards, and Cleveland Book Week are pleased to have you join us for this one-of-a-kind community conversation of restorative truth-telling and narrative change with the 2022 Annisville Book Award winner for fiction, Mr. Percival Everett, author of The Trees. At the conclusion of my initial remarks, Percival will honor us with a reading from The Trees then after some discussion, we will hear questions from the audience as we spend this time together tonight. So now I'd like to present to you Mr. Percival Everett. I'd like to start um by thanking Terry 
If you allowed uh, Mr. John Jordan five more minutes of life, uh, and that's what recognizing these, these crimes does. Um, when I started thinking about this novel, first of all, thank you for that introduction and thank you for having me. Um, these crimes uh, really aren't the result of, of, of evil in the world that exists. It's the result of neglect. Um, our neglect is a culture of, of recognizing them, identifying them, and trying to stop them. The events that were described by Terry um, could be any number of, of, of lynchings you know, with the very same details. And that same year, 1911, a man was taken from um, a jail in Laramie, Wyoming, and, and strung up on a, on a utility pole on 7th Avenue. Um, the paper the next day, the editor, admonished the citizens of Laramie not for their crime, but because out of the hundreds of bullets fired at the man's hanging body, only one person was able to hit him. Um, it's, it's a, this is our history. Um, and so I'll read this chapter. It feels strange reading it um, uh, because of the exercise of the names. And there's at one point I'll have to stop and tell you something that the book allowed me to learn. Uh, this scene involves um, Damon Thruff, who is a, an academic who has come to the house of this very old woman, uh, Mama Z, and she has compiled uh, file cabinets full of uh, the history of all the lynchings in the United States since um, the lynching of her father in 1903 or 1913. Damon Thruff wrote with a number three pencil, sharpened with its Phi Beta Kappa pen knife. Again and again, he scratched out names on a yellow legal pad. He scratched and scratched. Bill Gimmer, Shedrick Thompson, Ed Lang, John Henry James, Charles Wright, Henry Scott, Arthur Young, George Dorsey, May Dorsey, Dorothy Malcolm, Eugene Hamilton, Paul Booker, James Jordan, W. W. Watt, Lemuel Walters, George Holden, Will Wilkins, John Ruffin, Henry Ruffin, Eliza Woods, Anderson Goss, Huey Connerly, Dago Pete, Laura Nelson, William Thambro, Isidore Banks, Unknown Male, Tony Champion, Michael Kelly, Andrew Ford, Henry Henson, Unknown male. Charles Willis, William Rawls, Alfred Daniels, Manny Price, Robert Scruggs, Jumbo Clark, Jack Long, Henry White, unknown male. Reverend Josh Baskins, Bert Dennis, Andrew McHenry, Stella Young, Abraham Wilson, George Buddingham, Albert Martin, unknown male, unknown female, Richard Puryu, John Campbell. John Taylor, Ernest Green, Charles Lang, Ed Johnson, Andrew Clark, Alma Major, Maggie House, Nevelyn Porter, Johnson Spencer, James Clark, Levy Harrett, Harrington, Jack Minho, Albert Williams, Will Brown, Wyatt Outlaw, John Stevens, Perry McChristian, Felix McWilliams, Unknown Male, Bartley James, John Campbell, Eugene Williams, Robert Robinson, Rob Ashley, Cleo Wright, Lemuel Walters, Benny Richards, Lloyd Clay, Richard Price, Jim Waters, Frank Livingston, William Miller, Barry Washington, James Cheney, James Jordan, George Armwood, Sidney Randolph, George Taylor, James Carter, Emmett Divers, Smiles Estes, Dick Lundy, Jenny Steers, unknown male, 16 adult men, John Peterson, Frank Morris, James Byrd Jr., Albert Young, James Reed, Fraser Baker, James Scott, Joseph Smith, 
Francis McIntosh, George White, Zachariah Walker, Tom Moss, unknown male, unknown male. Calvin McDonald, Elias Clayton, Elmer Jackson, Isaac McGee, Will Stewart, John Holmes, Thurman Thomas, Elijah Lovejoy, Amos Miller, Jim Taylor, Elwood Higginbottom, Wade Thompson, Nelson Patton, David Jones, Ephraim Grizzard, Samuel Smith, 11 adult males, Angelo uh, Albino, Albano, Ferracato, Ferracato Villarosa, Lorenzo Saladino, Arena Salvatore, Giuseppe Vin, Vin, Venturella, Francesco Di Fata, Giuseppe Di Fata, Giovanni Cerami, Rosario Fiducia, Sanford Lewis, unknown male, Miles Pfeiffer, Will Temple, Robert Cross, John Heath, Matthew Williams, and I'll pause here. I won't, I'm going to the last names I'll read in this list before the text starts again, are David Walker. And I received a, a letter just a few weeks ago because in my book, the next name is David Walker's wife and the next name are David Walker's four children. Someone wrote me, uh, a woman in Tennessee, and told me what David Walker's wife's name was. Her name was Annie. And so I'd like to amend the text here. David Walker, Annie Walker, David and Annie Walker's four children. Well, the fuzz is gone, Mama Z said as she entered the records room. She was talking about the police. She observed the open dossiers and Thruff's disheveled appearance. Damon looked up. The FBI lady, Mama Z said. She studied Damon's red eyes and then the pages in front of him again. What are you doing? I'm writing their names by hand. Damon sharpened his pencil over a sheet of white paper. Mama Z pulled the pad toward her and looked at the list. Why are you doing this, she asked. When I write the names, they become real, not just statistics. When I write the names, they become real again. It's almost like they get a few more seconds here. Do you know what I mean? I would never be able to make up so many names. The names have to be real. They have to be real, don't they? Mama Z put her hand against the side of Damon's face. Why pencil? When I'm done, I'm going to erase every name and set them free. Carry on, child, the old woman said. Then the, lesson, then the list of names continues for another several pages. All right, wow, there we go. All right, so um, I don't know about you all, but as I was sitting here and I've, I've looked at that chapter, um, I downloaded the audio book too, by the way, and I listened to that chapter, but there was something about Percival as you read the names, um, there was a discomfort for me. Um, so many names. So many names. So I'd like to start our discussion today by saying this, that today's conversation is about healing. However, in order to heal, there needs to be a recognition of what is it that we are considering healing from. And so you've heard about uh, John Jordan, uh, which we are working on a project. And if you are interested in continuing with us on that project, please sign this form in the, in the hallway so that we can have a team that will actually discover and get the answers to those questions, do some of that research, have some of these conversations, because what we understand is sometimes a thing happens and when it happens, it gets covered up. And when it gets covered up, in the case of the chapter that you read, when those names don't get read, when those names don't get remembered, they get forgotten. And we can believe that our history looks differently than it does. However, we don't stay there. We dissipate that and then we fill it in with healing. 
And so our conversation today will be centered on the facts, because the interesting thing about the truth is it really doesn't care what we think about it. It doesn't really require our approval of it for it to be true. However, it's how we feel about it that determines how we move through our world. And so tonight, we're just gonna have some conversation. Um, I'm gonna ask a few questions. Hersel and I are gonna conversate a little bit. And we're hopeful that you all will join us on this journey. And at the end, we'll have some questions and some answers about what we've talked about tonight. Sound fair? All right, thank you. So let us begin. So uh, Percival, in the, in, in, in the reading that you just did, you shared the names from one of the chapters of your book. And from your perspective, can you speak to us about why saying the names of each person is so important? Important enough for you to dedicate an entire chapter. If you could speak to us about that. Well, it's, it's because each of these people experienced individual lives. Um, they weren't a group of people. Uh, they had their own wives, children, mothers, fathers. Um, and reducing anyone to a statistic is, uh, it cheats them of their, their humanity. Um, but it, you, you mentioned um, this idea of healing. The idea of healing, as, as a novelist, as an artist, um, and as an a African-American man, I have no interest at all in healing. Um, my interest is in, ex is in, ex is in exposing the wound. Um, I, I'll, I'll tell a, a, a very brief story that at first will seem to have nothing to do with this. Um, I ranched for many years. I, 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 I had horses, I especially am fond of mules, and I had a mule, my ride, who had a, one day developed a, a lump on his, on his neck. And that lump kept getting larger. And one day it was football sized. And it was hard to get a vet to come way out to my place. Um, he would occasionally. Um, um, and one day I was standing there with my ranch hand and I said, we're gonna find out what's in there. And I, I stuck a 20 gauge needle into his neck and tried to pull out whatever was in there and nothing came out. So it wasn't fluid. Um, and it bugged me and it bugged me. And finally I said, we're gonna cut him open. So I sedated the mule and I sliced open this huge lump on his neck. And we went rooting around through there and I couldn't find the cause of it. But I left it the way one does with, a, with an animal who lives outside. I didn't stitch him up. I just left it open, irrigated it, let it granulate, and then the lump was, and then the, the lump was gone. I didn't find the cause of the problem. Um, but addressing the problem solved the problem. I will never understand the thinking that allows people to kill other people indiscriminately. I don't want to understand what allows people to do that, but I know that they do. I don't need to heal from that evil. I just need to move on with the knowledge that it is not necessary. So that's where no, I, I appreciate that, and I'm, I'm so grateful that you shared that perspective with us. As we imagine um, how we move through the difficulties in our lives, it is important to understand what works best for each one of us. And so as we have this conversation, it's not a prescription of how you or any of us need to move forward. However, from the black environmental leaders perspective, one of the things that we recognize, somebody might say, well, why is an environmental organization even participating in this conversation? It's because of the unseen thing that all of us kind of know, but we don't necessarily articulate. And it is, it's something about that place that doesn't feel right. There's something about that that I just don't know that I wanna be in that space. 
those types of things live in a place. And so as, you, as we explore names, uh, a name that comes to my mind that I'd like to bring into this space to live a few more moments is Tamir Rice. Um, it's interesting how life unfolds, uh, Percival. I um, was here for a meeting on Monday in the neighborhood, and I was at Gallagher School, just not too far from here. And even though I knew that that was the school that Tamir Rice had walked from as he was walking to the rec center as his life was taken uh, in an act of violence, it hadn't dawned on me until I stepped onto the steps of the school and I saw his name. And in that moment, as a parent, I have four children. I cannot even fathom what it would be for one of my children to be taken from me violently. But yet that is not in the headlines anymore. So today, I wish to say Tamir Rice's name so that he may have a few more moments of life because his life ended far too soon. It doesn't heal it, to your point. It doesn't change the fact that he is no longer with us, but it does remember that he had an individual life that was worth recognizing, as each one of us do. And um, I'm grateful to have this group of folks here with us today who have assembled to say, you know what, each life is valuable. All shades of humanity, life is valuable. And as I look across the audience today, I see that representation of all shades of life, all shades of humanity. And that gives me hope that we can continue on this journey together. And as we continue on it together, it does get better as you spoke to. We don't have to know the root of it in order for it to get better. I think we can get lost in trying to find the root and never get to, um, to, the, to the better. So um, the other thing that I'd, I'd like to talk to you about is there's a national conversation in, in, in covering and elevating these narratives. Um, as we work toward the goals of equitable justice and truth telling, um, these notions are shaped, as I mentioned earlier, in three things. How we publicly remember the past, how we tell the stories of who we are, and how we explain the way our past influences our present. So in the trees, you tell us a story. And I'm interested in your thoughts as you were writing the trees regarding who gets to tell the story, our collective story. Um, was there some element of that for you as you were writing the trees, like using your agency to tell this story, even though it is a fictional story, there are a lot of notions that um, mirror real life. Well, I'm just a writer. I am. I, I wish I was smart enough to think about all that stuff a lot when I go to work, but I don't. I, I make up stories, and the stories mean what they're going to mean, then they do the work they're going to do in the world. Um, um, most of my work is, 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 is research. Um, and, and this novel is not the beginning of my sort of probing this idea of, of, of genocide, um, or as it says in this novel, the slow kind of genocide, the one that no one notices when it's one life at a time instead of many at the same time. It starts with my novel Telephone, um, uh, the, uh, the deaths of, of, of the Mexican women in, in Ciudad Juarez, um, which, yeah, is an awful, amazing story that we walk around not knowing about. Our culture doesn't recognize it. Perhaps 700 women dead and missing in this one place. 
for the trees, for, for, for a telephone, I went to, to Juarez, uh, to El Paso, and I went over into Juarez. It was Christmas time. And walked into the police station, and I met a uh, policeman who took me on a tour. He took me to where they'd found bodies. One place, they'd found eight bodies. And as I stood there, it was actually snowing, that part of Texas at that time, and I could see from this hill El Paso, which is, an, which is a relatively safe, a very safe American city. And I was standing here where they'd found these, these, these women. And so in the, because there are so many, we can't conceive it. It becomes unreal to us. But to every one of those families who lost a daughter or a wife or a mother, it was the end of the world. And that's what I was, I was left with. Um, and it was, then it was tied to something, to, to trafficking, as I stood there with this, this, this a very nice cop on this corner. Um, and there was a three-story building and he said, um, he said, on the third floor, that's where the cartel is. And I said, what's on the other two floors? He said, a brothel. And, and there I, again, confronted with all these lives being taken, um, but in a different way. And so, you know, you know it's, it's this is a funny book, <laughs> and, and you wouldn't know it to hear me talk about it like this. Um, and, and, and part of the reason it's, has, it's, it's funny is I, I'm pathologically ironic, but, but because in these times where we face these things, in the death camps, people had humor. And that's, and that's, and that's what gets us through it. That's what makes us who we are. Um, uh, through the history of, of, of black people in this country being slaves, those, those slavery years are full of humor. Cakewalks and, and songs, which leads to ironies that, that we can't even, um, uh, that we, it's hard to even understand. The fact that white people would dress up as minstrels and then perform cakewalks, which were performed by black people to make fun of white people, but the white people performing the cakewalks had no idea of the, re of the, of the, of the uses of these things. It's, that's what history gives us, the opportunity to appreciate those ironies and to laugh and to understand that life continues. And life definitely does continue. Um, at this point, I'd like to take a little bit, a walk back in time. We've, we've talked about John Jordan, and I'm curious, are there patterns that stand out for you um, as you think about the writing of the trees, you think about John Jordan, and you think about even the state of our, um, our country today? Patterns. Um. Oh, well, if you just start looking at the newspapers in the last um, uh, 40 years, um, how many times has a white person been shot? 15, 20, 40 times by the police. I don't know of one, save the Bonnie and Clyde movie. Um, how many times has that happened to a black man? Well, that's a pattern. Um, and we don't need statistics to recognize that. Um, so as you, as you think about patterns like that, and I'm going back to your analogy about, you know, working on your farm, exposing the matter and then it healing or there being or it being resolved 
what do you see or do you see um, a path forward in that regard that we could glean from? Again, I'm just a, a writer. Anytime you look to an artist for advice about life, is um, that, that's, that's a bad move. Um, well, I've been told that, 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 that writers and artists are probably some of the most creative thinkers and most innovative thinkers. So perhaps it's not the advice. It's, uh, I mean, the fact that I choose to write fiction to make a living is, is ample evidence that I'm mentally deficient. Um, <laughs> I, 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 can, I can expose the, uh, I, 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 can, I can create a world and, and tell a story, but no work is complete until um, the reader comes to it. Yeah. Uh, that, that's where the meaning gets me made. I'm not smart enough to make the meaning. I, I have some talent in, in raising the questions. And so that's, that's, that's my job. And all, all meaning is personal. What my work means to me is not, should not, cannot be what it means to any of you. So have you, as you've traveled and you've spoken to people, and I, I know just sitting next to you in the audience, numerous people came up and said how much they were enjoying your book. Can you share some of the stories about, uh, that people have brought to you as far as what your book did for them as they read it and, and how it impacted them, perhaps in ways that kind of surprised you? I don't know, I don't listen. You know, it's, it's, uh, <laughs> um, That's nice when people read, read the work. I, I, I would just, just, I would be happy if they never associated me with it. Um, um, I suffer from what we in my house call work amnesia anyway. Um, you could open this book and, and read a paragraph to me and I would have no idea where it's from. I forget it, because I'm working on something else. Um, um, one thing I can say about making, um, any kind of art, making fiction in this country, is every bit of literature created through this American experience is about race, no matter who has written it. If there is no race in it, that was a choice made by the writer, which says a lot about their ignorance or uh, uh, desire to ignore this um, essential feature of the American experience. Um, I have a, a very quick story. Uh, I, I, I used to work ranches in, and, um, uh, in, in Idaho, and I was delivering cows to someone in Baker, Oregon. Um, and I don't, I became, I'll give you an idea of what the Pacific Northwest, east, uh, west of the, um, east of the um, Cascade Mountains is like, I became known as the black guy just by driving through Idaho. Um, but I stopped, was stopped a woman on the street to ask her where this address was, the man who owned the feed, feed lot. And she looked at me and she looked around and she said, yes, it's three blacks that way. <laughs> and I said, it can't be nearly that far. <laughs> but that was, that was where I was, and that's, where I, and that's, and that's, that's a very American experience. Yeah, no, I mean, that, that, that's a great story because it's a, I think one of those things around race that um, as we talk about the book a little bit more, I'd, I'd love for you to speak to um, the impact, if at all, um, you thought it would have or could have on your, on your children. I mean, as parents, we think about how does the work or, or does that impact you? The work that we do, does it have any influence or any um, insight for our children? No, we always. Hope. Here's open, right? Um, uh, well, I have I have sons. I have brown sons. I have to have the talk with them. That what's become known as the talk. When I was a kid, it was just well, common sense. Uh, the white guy with the gun and the badge says, "Get on the ground." Well, it, it behooves one to get on the ground. Um, it's sad that we have to reiterate that to our, our children, but we do. Because um, 
this American experience wants us, we want in it, to find progress much faster than it actually happens. Um, as a teenager, my instinct was to say no. And I was very lucky several times. That's stupidity. It's not wrong. But I was, I was, I was not doing what was in my best interest. That said, I'm really glad I said no. Um, and, and maybe that's a part of what drives us to make art in this culture. Yeah, I mean, I would say to write a book like The Trees, even though it, it does have humor in it, it's still dealing with a very heavy topic, a topic that is not one that we've been socialized that we should be talking about. And so there is courage there. Um, that I'd just like to uplift and I'd like to thank you for having the courage, uh, whether it is, is the women in your, in it, that you mentioned earlier or it's the characters within this book. Um, there are so many other things you could be writing about. And so I just thank you for the courage uh, to, to, to say what others are not willing to say and to speak at times when others will be silent. So thank you so much for um, our short conversation. I wish it could have been longer, but I'm getting the cue that it is time for our question and answers. So uh, we're going to say thank you for that portion. And uh, we are ready for whoever is answering or asking the questions. The microphone drama, we're down the mic. So we're going to ask you to write a question and we'll collect them and we'll take it from there. Would you raise your hand if you've got a question? Great. I think I have a question here I could, I could start with. Uh, it says, what is your opinion on the accuser of Emmett Till remaining free with no persecution to this date. She is a, alive and activist and the family want her charged. Uh, Carolyn Bryant lives in Raleigh, North Carolina. And just recently, um, the warrant for her arrest was found in an archive in, um, in, in Mississippi. Um, and uh, some young people decided they were gonna try to serve this warrant uh, and, and I appreciate the, the idea of it, um, but as you know, attempting to serve this warrant is nothing but uh, theater. Theater is not always bad, but when you when you when when performing theater, you got to get it right. And they stormed into the wrong nursing home, oh. and and we're told, well, she doesn't live here. <laughs> Um, and that's what made the news. Um, Carolyn Bryant was a, probably a, a simple-minded person, um, uh, controlled by uh, her husband, um, uh, what was his name? Obviously, last name Bryant, and, and uh, his brother-in-law, Milam. Um, and she lied about young 14-year-old Emmett Till in Money, Mississippi, uh, either commenting or whistling at her. Um, and they, those two men, then killed um, this young, young man and beat him so badly that he was unrecognizable and threw his body off a bridge. Um, his mother, uh, is one of the more courageous people in this, in this culture. Uh, despite so-called authorities um, telling her to do otherwise, she had his funeral be open casket. 
so the world, as she said, the world could see what they did to my son. And that image um, became iconic, but it's, it's, it's also telling that in our culture, it only surfaces occasionally as something that bothers us. Um, in fact, the last time it surfaced, and I wish I could remember the name of the artist, a white woman made a, paint, a painting um, of, of, of Emmett Till's um, corpse. Um, sorry, Dennis Schutz. Um, and, and, and granted, um, as a painter myself, I was not impressed by the work. But she was attacked for appropriating this image for her work, and I think that was wrong and unfair. Um, none of this belongs to any of us individually. It belongs to us as a culture. And she is as much part of this culture as I am and has as much reason to, to, to hearken back to that iconic image as, as do I. Her white, uh, um, not ancestors, literally, but the white, but white America, if we view it in that way, is responsible for that death. She, as an artist, has to deal with that in the same way that I, as a, as a, a member of that victims, and I use that word with quotation marks, victims um, uh, uh, culture and society have to deal with it. Finally, we're just American having to deal with this very ugly past. Anything that gets us looking back and talking about it is viable as art. And one of the things that I think we have come to do as a culture is instead of viewing, cutting open the mule, is we decide we're going to virtue signal and tell, tell each other who can and who can't have some proprietary feelings about, about the evils of, of, of our past. Yeah, I agree. I think that turns into a, it turns into a place and a space where we can get stuck. And when we get stuck in those spaces, we don't get past that space. We just get stuck there. No, that's what the problems with liberals too. I mean, I'm as left as you can get. And, and it drives me crazy that, um, the, the spineless crazies on the other side um, come up with slogans all the time. Well, we come up with we come up with eight-page position papers explaining how how complex the problem is. <laughs> right. That doesn't get people to the polls. It does not. It gets us stuck. So I have a couple more questions if you're if you're up for them. Okay. So uh, can we talk about the names of the characters in the book? the jokes within the names, the humor, and the meaning. How do the fictional names interact with the real list of names that you read earlier? Well, there's a real power in naming. Um, and, and that was some of my power over the people who were or the, the villains of, the, of this book. Um, they don't do. They're not necessary for the work that the, the book does. It adds another level of meaning for me, um, but this is, you know, this is, if, if my parents had named me Conway Twitty Everett, I'd be a country music singer. Uh, words, do, words do work. Um, uh, and, and, at least in, in the text um, here, uh, there's meaning behind the names that allows me some shorthand. And again, um, because I get bored, I was, I was having some fun, being perfectly honest with you. Please speak to some of the names if you don't mind. I don't remember them. I, <laughs> uh, the only one I really liked was the governor of South Carolina who was uh, uh, no, I can't remember that. Pinch Wayface. Um, 
And um, no, I, I again, I, I forget this stuff as soon as I make it. So. Interesting. You know that I, I'm almost tempted to like grab the book and say, I am going to ask a question to the audience. So, the person who asked this question, if you are here, when you wrote this there was a name or a couple of names that inspired you or you found some delight in. Do you mind saying a couple of those names? Yes. Red Jenny. Oh, well, that's Redneck. <laughs> a Jetty is an accent. Yes. Is there another? That's the one that made you laugh. That's the one that made you laugh the most? Okay. May I ask, what was it about it that, that made you chuckle out of all the names? It's, it's a clever word for Redneck. And yeah, I, I was really interested Mm -hmm. So was there uh, any type of um, just a position? Well, there's a, there? There, there, you know, there, there's a, it creates a, a, a buffoonery for these characters. But one of the things you, that you experience growing up as, a, as a, a black kid, especially when I grew up, was you, you, you saw these characters on television. You saw the, the, the wide-eyed um, black porter in, the, um, in the, the old movies. And every time you saw a black figure on a crime show, it was a, a pimp or a, or, or a druggie. And, 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 um, and, and as we became more aware in the culture, what, what's interesting is that, well, late at night, I can still turn on the television and see that wide-eyed black porter, despite our awareness of it. Um, and, and, this, and so the novel becomes a, a bit of turnabout. The characters that depicted in here aren't uh, the, 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 the um, they're extremes. The white characters are extremes in the same, and stereotypic in the same way that, that black characters have been stereotyped in, 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 in other um, forms of entertainment in, in our culture. So it's, it's a bit of turnaround. Yeah. And I'd be interested, I know we don't have time to talk about it more tonight, but you know, like, how does that feel being on the other side of that when we've all been socialized, that it goes very much like what you said initially, that it's the, it's, it's the black characters, it's the buffoonery of that, and to have a little bit of that turnaround, it's like, is that odd? Or I know you didn't care. It's great fun. <laughs> and it is, um, uh, what's interesting is, is, is it, 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 it bugs some people. Or aren't these people, they don't really exist, do they? <laughs> it's a novel. None of them exist. <laughs> the only ones that exist are the ones on that list. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I have another question here if you're, okay, so is there an experience of joy or a smile that came as you learned from the people, your characters and stories? So as you were moving through the story, was there any moments of joy or smiles that came to you? There must have been because I finished it. Um, <laughs> um, no, sure. I, 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 I'm, I wasn't jumping up and clicking my heels and stuff, but yeah, I, I, I must have enjoyed moments of it. I would imagine, because it's, it's like they're coming to life. I mean, they're, they start in your imagination, and then as you're putting the words on the paper, they're coming to life. Even I wish they would. That would help a lot. <laughs> uh, no. <laughs> I'm waiting for that book that writes itself. You know. Then the book took over. Please. <laughs> All right, I have another one here. It says, I think you said that you started writing a while ago. What happened? What didn't? What did not? Or what did the journey look like? And what finally enabled you to finish it? So I think what we're looking at is here. You started a while ago. Uh, what was the time period you said that you started? Oh, I, I always say this novel took me sixty-three years. That's to write. right. You said sixty-three but, but years, and I thought I was doing the math. I was like, wait, he doesn't look like he's older. Well, it, but. I mean, I wrote the book in a year, but it's 63 years of experience, not counting my first two, that I, um, okay. that, that's, that I needed to understand the world well enough to, to write it. But that's how I feel about every novel. 
Okay, and then the second question is what happened um, and what did that journey look like for you in writing in the year? Like what was it that said, it's now, it's time for this book to happen? Or was there a moment like that? There was no moment. Well, I, I actually remember the morning where I, when I started this novel. Um, and and the, the wonderful irony of that is it came from my listening to um, a traditional uh, uh, black work song, a slave song actually, um, or sharecropper song, sung by a white man. Lyle, and with, with, with the black singers behind him, Lyle Lovett, the country singer, who writes great songs, but he, was doing, he does a cover of the song Ain't No Mo Cain, um, which has the, the verse, you should have been on the river, and you should have been on the river in 1904. Uh, you could have found you a dead man at every turn row. Wow. And, and, um, and it's coupled with a, with a um, uh, version of the song, another version of the song called Rise Up. And that is where this novel started. So, so I credit Lyle Lovett for, for having You credit Lyle that. Lovett for the inspiration. You heard that song and yeah. you said, it's time. 63 I, years is, is happening. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, um, and then the last part, okay, so I guess that finally enabled you to finish it. Well, I don't know what it is. I, my, how I finish things by putting my bills on my desk is how I finish things. <laughs> it's always, so, so, so are you telling us, I'm, I'm going straight in on this one. I, are you telling us that this race-based race conversation is an economic one? No, this is America. <laughs> I, um, if, I, if, I, if, I were, if I were trying to get rich, I wouldn't be a fiction writer. Um, <laughs> Uh, likewise, if I was trying to get a truth, I wouldn't sell deodorant. Um, if you were trying to get to what? I missed that last piece. To truth. Oh, if you were trying to get to truth, <laughs> you would not sell deodorant. Yes. I, I agree um, with that. And, um, and thank goodness. Yes, go ahead. Um, so part of my job as an artist is to be able to make the next thing. And that's what I tell my, my students too. You can be as high-minded about the world as you like, but if you can't find a way to put your work into it, well, you can be happy with it and that's it. Yeah, yeah, that makes me think about another concept that I find great comfort in, and it's this notion of whatever you do, do it as though you are doing it for your beloved. And that speaks to, you know, what is the motivation for your work? at least for me, because you know, you spoke earlier as a black man, your experience I know for me as a black woman, in my experience there are times that my heart is actually broken, sincerely broken. And there's choices to be made, right? It's like, okay, you can kind of just lean in on that, it wasn't right, it hurt, whatever. Or you can use things like humor to come up out of that because at the end of the day there's still a contribution that each one of us has to make we've all been socialized to a standing or a place uh, i know for me typically it's like know your place be in your place you know you can't be a black woman with too much voice too much opinion too many ideas makes people uncomfortable that's not your place get back in your place or there's going to be repercussions to me sometimes that feels like a form of character lynching. Oh yeah, I, I never listened to that. Uh, the example is Billie Holiday. She sang uh, Strange Fruit until the United States government tried to stop her from singing the song Strange Fruit. Um, but she wouldn't stop. Uh, that impacted her career, didn't it? Uh, quite significantly. Um, yeah. uh, and probably even a, a, a more moving song than Strange Fruit, Strange Fruit having been written by a, by a white man. It's still quite, quite a great song, is, is Nina Simone's Mississippi Goddamn, which um, has in it a, a, a level, a layer and a level 
of, of, of hurt that very few songs achieve. True, true. So I, I'm sad to say that I think our time has come to an end. I have just one more question here that I put before you and it says, why was Mama Z treated so charitably? Did I read that word right from our question writer? That's interesting. I, I, um, well, she survived to be that old, but that, that's, that's certainly uh, not uncommon. I don't know if she was treated charitably. Um, her people, her father was lynched. Um, if one thinks that she was treated charitably, maybe the culture around her thought she'd suffered in that way. I don't know. Um, but it's a, it's a great question. Yeah, it is. Well, thank you again. I think uh, we're ready to move to yeah. Karen to take us to our next stage of the program. Thank you. Thanks. 